All right. Well, welcome, Team ET. It's another week. It's a fantastic week, as always. And uh, as is the norm, we have an extremely uh, well-versed expert guest joining us today. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I'm sure many of you will be after you uh, you learn about what we're going to be talking about. But um, it, it's quite an interesting topic. And I'm not sure how deep we'll be able to go. Our guests will be able to talk to this shortly. But uh, our guest is a B-2 stealth bomber pilot, or at least a retired B-2 stealth bomber pilot, <laughs> currently a pilot on a 787 Dreamliner. So still still doing what he loves and uh, flying around the world. And um, Joseph, welcome to the ET Project. It's fantastic to, to be able to get you on the show and uh, have this conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, this is great. Thanks for having me, Wayne. This is uh, fantastic. And I'm excited to impart some wisdom to the ET clan. I, I love that name, by the way. It's awesome. So hopefully yeah, we you. can uh, get into some deep stuff here. This is awesome. Oh, look, I, I'm sure we will. We we talk a lot about similar things. So um, I'm I'm excited to to listen to, you know, your your perspective on a whole range of, of stuff. I, I always like to kick off, though, um, by just understanding a little bit about our guest and you know who you are, where you came from, and what your background type of thing that brought you to that point. Um, and in this case, I'm going to say brought you to the point where you decided that you wanted to become a pilot. Mm. So um, maybe if you can take it from there for a moment and just uh, give us some background. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's see. I grew up in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So if if your folks aren't familiar, we use the mitten here and uh, over here. <laughs> so um, it's a small Midwestern town, you know, it's uh, very conservative in nature. And uh, right. my dad was uh, advertising manager at the Grand Rapids Press newspaper, and those don't really exist anymore. Right. <laughs> so um, and my mom was a bank teller at uh, at the local bank there, and so I grew up in a in a in a lower middle class, middle middle class uh, atmosphere, and I didn't really think that being a pilot was in the cards. But um, when I went to air shows, my grandfather and and my dad they would take me to air shows every once in a while, and and uh and i got the kick you know i was like wow this is incredible i want to do that i want to do the loops i want to do the <laughs> the fast burner right through the crowd you know and all that stuff and and i really that was my only drive at the time and i love to talk about this from my perspective now because um i'm a big fan of napoleon hill wow. and he wrote the book, The Law of Success. And it's a yeah. it's a very kind of obscure book. You know, most people know him from Think and Grow Rich, you know, but uh, but this is a 24 hour deal of audio, <laughs> which is wow. it's extremely <laughs> long, but I've listened to it now several times at the gym. And I would encourage uh, any of your team ET to really get into that because it's, it deals with your mindset and your flow and just having a definite chief aim in life. And I think that's so important. Um, you know, my definite chief aim became, I want to be a pilot in the air force. How do I get to become a pilot in the air force? And, mm. and so I turned over several leaves to do that. And, um, well, I, long story short, I went to Western Michigan University and they had an aviation program there. And I was like, okay, cool. This is an hour from home in Grand Rapids. So it's close and I can go check it out and, uh, and see if I actually want to do this thing. And my first semester in college, I remember it was like technical writing, college algebra, all this stuff that had nothing to do with, with flight. Right. And I'm like, wow, this is this is terrible. I don't want to do this. <laughs> so I actually went to the, the career counselor there on at the university and, and uh, sat down and took a battery of tests. And they said, well, Joseph, you should be a, a janitor or a firefighter. I'm like, well, great. <laughs> you know, that's, that really helps me out. Um, so fast forward to the next semester and I took my first aviation class and I was hooked. It was like, it was a history of aviation. And it was the first professor that I had that was really passionate about what they were teaching. 
And that really set me off. And I was like, wow, this is this is incredible. So uh, from there, I started to get into the actual my my degree was aviation flight science. So you work through all your ratings from the private pilot, commercial pilot, uh, all the way up to uh, multi-engine commercial. And you can then in, decide where you want to go if you want to be. At the time, the, the flow was to the right seat of a regional airline. But I didn't really want to do that. I wanted to do the military path. So I pursued that in various aspects and then um, and got hired uh, through officer training school with the United States Air Force and went on to to do some some really cool stuff uh, that I'm sure we'll talk about here in, in a little bit. But that's kind of a brief summation. I grew up, you know, small town conservative and then uh, wanted to see the world. So. So. When I when I hear your story and we talk about um, six hundred pilots only have ever flown a stealth um, B two bomber, and uh, it it really takes me to the Top Gun uh, mindset. Thinking, is it like that at all? Like, is it um, how commercialized is that movie compared to the reality? You know, the latest Top Gun movie, and, and in fact, mm. I was inspired by Top Gun 1. It was it was awesome. You know, I remember when that came out and uh, and I was like, oh, I want to do that. And then then the air show thing and all that. But uh, uh, to answer your question, you know, it's kind of similar. There's the, with the B2 community, it's very elite. It's top of the the top of the top you apply for the program. And mm. I'll just tell you a little bit of the story of how I got hired. So um, they bring you into the simulator and you're with about 25, 26 uh, other folks that have been applying for the program and have made it through the different selection processes to get to the in-person interview. Yes. And when we're there, they, they give us about a five or 10 minute uh, introduction to what's going to happen. You're going to go fly this simulator and it's an evaluation. It's a test, right? And you've never seen this airplane before. You don't know. Uh, I, I remember leaving that briefing, not knowing which side of the attitude indicator where where we where we look to see if we're up, down, left, right, which side of that the airspeed was on. I'm like, wow, this is incredible. I've never seen anything like this. And you get in there to the simulator. And I remember walking through two bank vault doors to get there. It's super secure, right? Like boom, right? And, you, and you're just intimidated by the environment. And you get down in the simulator and it's cold and and the, the instructor evaluator, he's like, all right, Joseph, you know, here, here you go. This is the, the stick. Here's the throttle. And uh, this is an evaluation. I'm going to kind of coach you through the next, you know, what the next maneuver is, but you have to be able to perform. I mean, that's what we're grading and go. <laughs> and at the time, I didn't know what that was for, you know, and now I look back on it. And it was totally about how fast that you can fail forward and grow, right? So if you, you know, you're in a completely different environment, you're, uh, and I'm sure a lot of your ET team can, can relate to this, you know, you're thrown into something and you're just like, wow, how do I deal with this new environment? And you have to be able to make mistakes and grow really fast. And that's what the whole test was about. Uh, which was incredible because I just took a deep breath at that moment and I'm like, okay, I know I'm going to make mistakes, but if I can just be in the moment and fail forward, I can do this thing and let's just have fun with it. Right. So I take off, I do the thing and uh, the next maneuver, the next maneuver, I screw some stuff up and I end up just like kind of laugh through it. Right. And and I was able to just be present in the moment and and perform for that hour simulator check ride, basically that I had I had no idea about. And it's it's <laughs> such a valuable lesson for your folks that are listening to this because it's it's so incredibly important to fail forward, not dwell on those past mistakes, mm. but grow through them, do some reflection. And I'm sure we'll talk about that a little later, but uh, do some reflection later on, but then use yeah. that experience to catapult you and elevate you into the future. 
And, um, you know, for the Top Gun stuff, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty similar to that environment. I mean, you got the, the top of the top people that are competing with each other and with themselves to, to be the best. And, and it was great because we had people from all over the Air Force. We had folks like me that came from the KC-10 extender, which was a, a tanker platform. We gave gas in the sky to fighters and bombers. Right. And we had folks that came from, you know, fighters and bombers and, and cargo aircraft. It was, we had this huge um, entity of, of information available to us at any time. We never really had to reach out to any foreign, uh, you know, we didn't have to reach out to the CIA or something like that. We had all that, that information in house, which made it a really great environment. So I heard you say the, the simulation exercise lasted an hour. That's a lot of, it that's a lot of pressure to be <laughs> for an hour. It, it is, is right? right? Yeah, incredible. And, and did you manage to land okay, or you didn't crash? I'm, I'm guessing otherwise you probably just did. <laughs> yeah, you know, we never find out how we did on that simulator. It was kind of like a pass-fail type deal. Uh, but no, I didn't crash. I just had fun with it. I, I made sure I was in the moment and and I was able to land the airplane, which I hadn't done before. You know, it was brand yep. new. So. <laughs> yeah. But I guess that's um, that's probably one of the main criteria, right? I think these things are two billion, more than two billion a piece, right? <laughs> they, they don't yeah. really want you to write them off too often. <laughs> 2.2 billion dollars yeah so it's, wow. uh, it's a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> we, we'll go a little bit more into that in a minute but i i have to ask a question that's been it's been bugging me since we spoke the last time there, there's a lot of um popularity around the the um the military services in america we've got jocko willink we've got David Goggins with uh, Life Babbitt. Who who is there from the Air Force? Come on. <laughs> well, that's you true. That's Tom true. Cruise or what? Like. <laughs> <laughs> well, even that, you know, that's a Navy movie. So I don't know. Yeah, you're right. I don't haven't really heard of anybody stepping out in the Air Force type realm, but uh uh, you know, for me, it's all about just serving and, and giving to to leaders because that's what we need. I, I feel a great need to help leaders grow. And that's that's why I wrote my two books going on three now is just to right. impart those nuggets of of knowledge so that people can lead their companies better and be better yeah. entrepreneurs and help serve the people that they lead. I mean, that's one of the biggest things that uh, that we need. Right. For sure. Let, let's touch on the books right now, seeing, seeing you've mentioned it. Um, do you want to introduce the books? Uh, sure. Um, let's see. I got uh, the first one here is Stealth Elevate. It's, uh, it's leadership and business. Basically, I, I took my lessons learned throughout uh, KC-10 and then the B-2 Stealth Bomber and all the leadership experience that I had. In fact, I was... Um, uh, charged with turning a, a failing $170 million company in the Air Force around. And I turned it into a $220 million, what I call uh, powerhouse of productivity, because we were we were great at the end. When I got it, it was a disaster. <laughs> so right. all those lessons learned that uh, from, from that time period, and I, I really just kind of distilled that into stealth elevate but it's it's greater than that because it's um it's also i talk about my divorce in there and going through that and recovering into the person that you see before you today because i think it's so important that that we have that personal development piece along with the leadership piece and i i didn't have that at the time um you know i was so focused on my career progression that and i'm sure I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. You know, what's the next step? How do I get there? Da, 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 da. But I forgot about my personal development. And it took me going through that divorce and then finding myself going to counseling um, and really getting in touch with my emotions for the first time in my life mm -hmm. so that I could grow and become better. So that's all in Stealth Elevate. And now I'm writing the, the next series here. I got to duck down because I... I dropped it, <laughs> but it's how to elevate your life and leadership, the target backwards approach. 
and uh, and it's how we did business in the B2. And I really want to distill those lessons, those hard yeah. leadership lessons that, uh, that tactics and strategy that will help you grow your business and, and lead better, right? And so in the B2, I talk about, um, well, we we would get briefings from the CIA, NSA, all these three-letter agencies all the time. Right. And I remember one in particular, we were sitting there and the B2 pilot group is all together. It's classified, but we won't get into those specifics. But the premise behind this is so important. The briefer says, hey, look, uh, we think that this new this new weapon that you guys carry would be perfect for this target complex. And we're like, you know, if you look around the room at that time, you'd see every B2 pilot's eyes roll like, man. We don't function that way. We work from the target backwards. And that's one of the biggest things that I can instill to business is like, hey, work from the target backwards. You're going to have these little fires that come up in your day to day. Right. And you need to not get trapped into that because you're you need to put those fires out. But as the leader, you need to stay strategic and delegate that stuff to your 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 front people. Right. You need to have that delegation concept so that you can trust those people that are below you and beside you and you can get stuff off of your plate so that you can stay strategic and make those strategic decisions um, by working from the target backwards. And it's mm-hmm. it's so important that you have that target in mind, whether that's, you know, I want to make $23 million in 2023. It needs to be specific, measurable, timely, those three things. And we can get into, into all that stuff uh, a little deeper. But um, we basically, those are the two books right now. And then I'm working on, I'm about to put out uh, uh, part two of this series, which is uh, the art of elite execution. And we're going to get into chair flying and rock drills and uh, contingency plans. It's going to be great. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm just excited to impart all this unique knowledge that I have to help leaders grow, you know. There's about 100 different avenues we could go <laughs> based on what you just said. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Tony Robbins, I, I'm sure you've heard of Tony Robbins, but Tony Robbins often quotes Jim Rohn as his mentor, but uh, Jim Rohn apparently used to say success leaves clues mm. and um, if if I look at your career and um, everything you've achieved and you're still achieving where do you think those clues lie in the successes you've had like what what do you see as some of the real uh, milestone moments that led you mm. to this direction? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, I would say just being overall, I would say just being hungry, right? Never, (laughs) never kind of satisfied with what, where you currently are. And I think we always need to improve. You're either growing or dying and you need to always take that next step. We all have unique passions and talents that, that we're meant to give the world. So what are those for you? And um, for me, it was just a self-discovery process a- along the way. And, and right. I think one of the most monumental things that I went through in life was my divorce and just mm-hmm. hitting my rock bottom and not knowing which way was up and where to go from there and even how to recover. Thankfully, I had a great leader at the time who was like, you know, take as much time as you need. Uh, meet with me once a week. So I know that you're you're progressing, you know, but um, just, just take the time to get to know yourself and to grow. And it was amazing. Uh, Yeah. I I couldn't fly at the time. Anyway, I was flying the B2. I had just made instructor pilots. So, so out of those 600 pilots that you mentioned now, all of a sudden I'm top 25% of that elite group. And uh, it was, it was an incredibly humbling experience to fall from that because I was, I was so driven career wise. And the next step would have been, you know, going to the weapons school on the leadership path to the B2, uh, 
eventually to be general. I mean, they want everybody to be general. So, um, so I really hit, hit a wall right there and having to, to really find myself, um, was an incredible experience of just deep diving, going to counseling and being humble enough to do that. I think that was, that was absolutely critical for my growth and, um, and why I'm able to be so open and free now, because I, you know, one of the things that you don't see with it would be two pilots is stuff like this. They, don't, they don't get out there and, uh, because the world is so secretive and, and to do, to distill those lessons and put them into an unclassified setting that really helps people grow. Um, you know, a lot of people don't, they don't even think about doing that work. You know, it's just like, what's next, what's next, what's next. And, and fortunately for me, I've, I've had that experience of getting able, being able to, to divest and just take a pause and really look at the person in the mirror and say, mm -hmm. I don't know you, but I'm going to know you. And <laughs> that was, that became my, my drive. And now my chief aim in life is just to become the most effective agent of, of positive life and leadership transformational change that I can become. Right. And that way I just compete with myself every day. And that's another thing, you know, we were so used to comparing ourselves to other people and, and who's doing this. Oh, John over here, Susie over here, you know, there's the, I need to be better, whatever. And you really, you need to compete with yourself and mm. just become the best that you can become. So. So reading between the lines there, how, how critical throughout your career as the team environment been. So I, I could imagine it could be very easy to become that singular entity only worried about yourself. But yeah. how critical was the team environment for the success of everything? Uh, super critical. I mean, we would, we would be charged with a task at the beginning of a 12 hour day that would, it would blow most people away. Like, Hey, uh, you need to solve this impossible goal by the end of today. And you have to do it because you're running into crew rest, which is a hard, hard thing. You need to get your rest for this mission that you're going to go fly that you're planning right now. And in order to do that, you needed to really trust and delegate extremely well. Mm -hmm. And when I was, um, when I was first learning this, I thought I was good. I, th I was like, man, I'm a, I'm a B2 aircraft commander. I can do this next step. Formation lead, no big deal. And that's where you go from your single ship where it's all about you and, and your co-pilot to now you're leading three or four or more B2s. And, mm -hmm. and you have, and each of them has a leader in their respective aircraft. Right. And so you have to be able to bring that team together really quickly. And when I first started doing that, it was, uh, it was a disaster. I got up there and I'm like, yeah, you know, the, Hey, welcome to Reaper one, one flight. This is our objective today. And this is what, and I took too much responsibility on myself. And right. so my team quickly called me out and hopefully you have a team that'll call you out. Right. Because it's, uh, it's so important. We don't know as as the individual how we're doing, right? We think we're doing great, but if if we don't get that external feedback, we'll never know. Yeah. And uh, and fortunately, I had my team there. They called me out. They're like, "Hey, you're putting way too much on yourself. You need to get rid of some of this stuff so that you can focus on developing these contingency plans." And that and that's so critical too, as yeah. the leader you need to be strategic and you need to think of what can kill my mission right now. What can kill my company right now? What can, what is going to keep us from getting to this goal? And you need to be focused on that and delegate everything else away. And so mm -hmm. I really, through repetition and practice, because I, I, I suck so bad at that first one that I was like, okay, uh, my boss would come into the scheduling office and I, I was kind of cowering. Uh, I was like, man, I, I need to, I need to get more reps as number three and not in the lead. I need to see this done right from, from somebody else. And he would come in and we have these magnetic pucks 
And uh, he would see my name and he'd be like, okay, well, boom, he'd put me into the number one slot. And now I was formation lead. And you're not going to, it was a great leadership decision and it didn't take any words. He just saw me and boom, put the puck back in the first spot. So it's like, hey, either grow and get more reps to to grow faster or fail. I mean, that's it. You're going to get the opportunity. So let's see what you do. And I would just, uh, you know, one of the lessons that I impart when I speak or or do executive coaching or uh, anything, it really is, is, hey, give your folks the chance. So instead of going with your top burners or who you think are your top burners, go with that person that failed once before because they got a chip on their shoulder now. They got something to prove and give them the opportunity to succeed, right? Give them give them the tools, give them some mentoring, like, hey, this is what you did wrong. Do a debrief real quick and be like, okay, cool. Here's some tools to help you succeed and now go do it. And we're going to give you the opportunity to do it as opposed to, you know, going with somebody that that's proven that they've done it over and over and over because case in point, I was able to become one of the best flight leads in the squadron because I had those opportunities. And mm. so often we just overlook that. We're like, wow, that, that guy really screwed up. That girl screwed up, you know? Yep. And uh, we need to give those folks more opportunity because they might just surprise you. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> there, there's so many uh, valuable lessons in what you've just said there for, for leadership in general, regardless of what environment you're in. Uh, I think, some great great insights there. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the programs that you're doing, um, but before I jump into that, there's there's a um, a theory, and I I believe it came from one of the colonels in the in the Air Force. Um, a theory called the UDA UDA loop. So UDA is a four four word acronym, um, and I know you speak about it and you, you've obviously used it. I wonder if you could talk to that and, and the importance of that decision-making process. Yeah, uh, fantastic. So OODA Loop, I think it was Colonel John Boyd that came up with this back mm -hmm. in the Vietnam era. I don't know. But uh, OODA Loop is a decision-making process that you can just use in your daily life, which is awesome. Uh, use it in your business and your daily life. OODA stands for observe, orient, decide, act. Mm -hmm. And you just want to, and that's your very basic decision-making model, and it works as a great foundation. So whenever you're hit with a crisis, um, for example, like when we have an engine fire in the airplane, right? We, uh, we, we initially, they say, hey, smoke a lucky. And <laughs> Because you're hearing all these bells and whistles going off and everything, and you need to first observe what is going on, right? And then you have to orient yourself. Okay, is it the left engine? Is it the right engine? What is it? What is actually happening right here, right now? And what do I need to do? And then, uh, and then you have to decide, and then you have to act. So there's those four things can happen really, really quick. But the first thing you have to do is just calm yourself because as the leader, you need to make that decision and get your team on board. So whether it's, um, you know, we just had uh, the Silicon Valley bank failure, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and many bank failures. So if your assets were all tied up in Silicon Valley bank, you're like, holy crap, you know, this thing just, just went to Yep. Uh, you know, what do we do? And so you need to observe, orient, decide, act. How do we get our, how do we get our assets out? How do we uh, function on the day to day? I mean, so many startups were in that bank and I can't imagine, you know, um, the, the pressure of that mm -hmm. decision to, you, know, you got to get your stuff out. Let's go, let's grow. And so that's, that's one of the biggest things you got to observe, orient, decide, act. I'm a big fan of OODA loop. And mm. I know that you, you teach it as well, right? Right. Yeah. Well, I, I did a uh, leadership program in the Middle East probably a decade ago now, uh, and I introduced it back then. And um, yeah, it was it was really a uh, a nice stumble to to get the opportunity to talk to you when I saw that you talk about it. So yeah, that's <laughs> I wanted to bring it up. But you know, one one of the things that fascinated me. Uh, 
um, and it would be really relevant for you, I, I believe, in your career, is it's such a simple um, methodology but so powerful. But having that self-awareness and the regulation to be able to, to step back, to pause for that moment in amongst the chaos, this is the challenge for most leaders, to be able to say, you know what, the world around me is burning, but I need to orientate myself first before I then do something. Absolutely. Um, you need to take that second to, to orient yourself, because if you if you just jump into decision making, you're not going to make good decisions right then. You know, mm -hmm. you need to at least... Just, just remember that piece, you know, smoke a lucky, smoke a lucky cigarette. Just be like, yeah. okay, take a deep breath is another example of that. Just, yeah. just, you know, okay, what is going on? Everything's burning. Now I need to orient what is really going on. Get your situational awareness picture, right? And that's mm -hmm. what we talk about in aviation all the time is you only know what you know at that moment. So try to gather other information like for us it's like radio calls and um the environment what's going on is there thunderstorms over there is there different turbulence this and that so in your business world you need to just greg gather that situational awareness picture bring in other people you know what's really going on gather the data okay the bank failed right so what are what are our options and just listen take a breath get some other opinions, gather the data before you make your decision, as opposed to just rushing into something. Oh, we need to do this now, because you're going to look back on that and be like, eh, maybe that wasn't the best decision at the time. We, we were talking before we hit record, we were talking about the incident with the pilot that landed on the Hudson River. And, oh, uh, yeah. and that, that process that he must have gone through in his mind to remain as calm as he did, to be able to make that decision, those calculations, um, you know, it could have so easily been entirely wrong and ended in disaster, but it had a great outcome. And, you know, I, I look at those moments as the testaments of people that are able to really put these theories into practice. They're no longer just uh, an abstract that we read about in a book. These are really useful, implementable tools that people have demonstrated work. And I, I, I like to look um, at leadership in that sense or from that perspective. So I think it's a, it's a great tool. I didn't mention earlier, uh, Joseph, your company is also called Stealth Elevation, if I'm correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, so that's a play off of, uh, off of the stealth bomber, obviously, yeah. but it's also what we need to do inwardly. And I think that's more important. So stealth elevation, uh, the tagline is, Hey, we're going to work on the stealth stuff, the stuff that no one sees you doing so that you can elevate to an outside world. Yeah. And it's so important that we do that. And whether it's, you know, your personal development is, is critical. So leaders are readers. I've always, I've always been ingrained to that and you need to read everything that you can. Right. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I'm, I'm an avid reader, two books a week. So I, I'm, I'm up there with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so important. You get so yeah. many good ideas from all kinds of different backgrounds and it just helps you uh, become a better leader. Right. And, and so that's that stealth stuff that we're working on. You know, you're working on that and you're also getting the situational awareness picture for your business and mm -hmm. making those decisions. You need to take time to recreate or recreate uh, Earl Nightingale, a uh, big fan of Earl Nightingale who passed away, but he, he would talk about that all the time. You need to recreate uh, yourself. And I think it's a daily process that we go through you know you're not the same today as you were mm. yesterday so you know for me personally i do uh meditation in the morning i do mm. gratitudes you know i'm thankful for the day I mean, that's so critical you, know, yep. you wake up you see a sunshine or 
whatever, even if it's cloudy, you grab your coffee, you just take a few moments before you start your day, whatever that is for you to orient yourself. It goes back to the OODA loops thing, observe, orient, decide, act, right? So you're, you need to orient yourself to yourself and yourself is different today than, than yesterday. So take some time, even five minutes to just to be, to be grateful, to do some meditation, to be like, all right, where am I today? How am I feeling? Uh, where do I need to grow? And how do I maximize this day? And that's how I, how I approach the day. And I just try to make the most out of every day because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Right. And so it's, uh, it's so important that you do that, that stealth stuff that no one sees you doing. Um, and you just work on that because it's going to help you in every aspect. Right. And at the other end of the spectrum, you also talk about the the debrief of the activity from the day being the the real area where you learn, um, where the learning occurs. Maybe yes, yeah. Um, so debriefing is so critical, and we often don't do it right because we we're constantly worried about the next fire, this and that we need to learn from the day. We need to learn from the goal. If we set a goal out there and we said, Hey, look, we didn't hit it, but, uh, but that's cool. And we just move on to the next thing. That's bad. We need to, we need to take some time to debrief and, and to do this in an organized way is absolutely critical. It's going to be part of this book series that I'm writing, but um uh, for your audience, it's, you need to figure out the contributing factors. So you need to list out like four contributing factors, why you failed at this or that, uh, mm -hmm. or maybe why you succeeded at this and that you can take those lessons as well. And you right. need to boil it down to a root cause. And so there's one thing that did it. And guess what? It's not the environment. And I talk about, we, we talk about that all the time in the stealth bomber. And, uh, and also I talk about it uh, with stealth elevation. You cannot have a root cause that is due to the environment because everybody's playing in the same environment. Everybody's playing in the same. So like if you're in a, a American football game and you're both out there in the rain there's a battle going on, but guess what? The rain is not the issue. It is, it is absolutely your execution. So, um, you know, we talk about thunderstorms coming up in our pathway for bomb release or something and be like, wow, we could, we could blame it on the thunderstorm being there. No, you still have to put bombs on target. So you could have done something else. You could have planned around that. You could have mm. done anyway. You need to come up with a root cause. The one thing that caused you to for success or failure for that goal or that day or whatever you're, you're grading. And then the biggest thing is you need to come up with an, what I call an exciting elevation. What will you do next time? Right. Mm. Okay. So I figured out uh, my contributing factors, you know, the, uh, that there were thunderstorms in the area, the winds were out of limits, blah, 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 whatever it was for you. It was, uh, you know, SVB bank failure. We had, uh, we put all our assets in one place. We're not going to do that again. So like this, you know, so you got to figure out what you will do next time. And that's, that's how you wrap that thing full circle. Um, and I'm going to expand upon that in this, this leadership book series, but, uh, but real quick, you, uh, so contributing factor, root cause, and some sort of exciting elevation, what you'll do next time and get your team on board with that. And let's learn, let's grow. And let's put that into as a base uh, foundational piece for our next goal that we're going after. And I can imagine it's like, it's like anything. When you first start doing this, it takes a bit of time. But it the does. more you do it, the more consistently you do it, the more familiar you become with it it becomes second nature and you do it very quickly and, and it doesn't take much time. The reason I say that is I can imagine there's a lot of people sitting there listening at the moment thinking, man, I don't have the time to do that. You know, I'm too busy fighting the fires. If only I had that amount of time, that luxury. The reality is the fires are a result of not doing it. <laughs> in, in exactly. many yeah. Yes. You need to take that time. And, 
and you're right. We we would spend like three hours doing this in the Air Force, and nobody has that that type of time to dig that deep, right? And especially in the business world. So, uh, so what I've developed is is a way to do this in five or ten minutes, where you can you can really get down. And if you focus on those three things, you know, the contributing factor, the root cause, and the exciting elevation, you can do it very quickly. And the more practice that you get at it, absolutely, you become faster. But mm -hmm. you need to take some time if you don't take that time like you said you're just going to repeat the same stuff over and over again like wow wow we failed at that we failed at that we failed at why don't we yep. learn from this and stop failing all the time yeah so, uh, so important we're, we're running short on time so I, I want to touch on um, some programs that you have that you use as a basis when you're working with your clients and i i believe there's three or there's three uh, levels to it the first is the um developmental base leadership program. The second is the stealth based leadership. And then you have a team based leadership. So I wonder if you'd like to just introduce those briefly. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Wayne. Um, so developmental based leadership, I, I talk, it's more of a broad audience. So this is, these are different, uh, different speaking type engagements that I do and they're all customizable and we can intertwine them based on your, your needs as the client. But, uh, but basically developmental based leadership is more on the self development piece. Like I'm going to speak more on my journey from, um, from going through the divorce and going through counseling and what I learned and then incorporate some of the goal setting and execution that we did in the B2 Stealth Bomber that will absolutely elevate you in life, leadership and business. And it's, it's great stuff. Um, the stealth based leadership is more for executives because it's uh, okay. We're going to get into the the nitty gritty of, of things that we just talked about the debrief, right. And we're going to learn how to set goals better from the target backwards. I'll explain that in your terms where yeah. we use what you're going after. And then we put it in specific measurable and timely characteristics. And you'll see how powerful that is. And then we work through the whole execution piece and setting contingency plans and how important that is as the leader. You need to think of things that are going to throw you off. And if you don't do that, you're running into a fire that is preventable, right? So if if you can come up with some contingency plans for your mm -hmm. business, like what is going to throw you off right now? Uh, or in the foreseeable future, like, hey, we're going to have a capital crunch in six months. Well, instead of waiting for six months, maybe you can actually plan that out and, and work around that and so that it's not a fire, right? And mm. uh, there's so many ways that we can pivot during execution. And uh, it's so critical that we do that to keep our companies moving forward. And so as a leader, you need to, to really invest in contingency plans. You need to do some chair flying for your business and I'll explain that. And then uh, you need to do rock drills, which are rehearsal of concept, especially if you're going into negotiations, you need to kind of role play this thing out. The Blue Angels do a spectacular job. You can look this up on YouTube. Uh, go look at uh, Blue Angels pre-flight briefing and you'll see them it is amazing they fly 18 inches apart for 45 minutes you know there's no room for error and what they do during their pre-flight is fascinating and this is what we did in the b2 as well for different things but they'll get there they'll close their eyes and they'll visualize what is going to happen and the leader and if you listen to the radio calls, it's amazing. They're they're talking to each other real calm. And the, the leader is like, and now we're, and they all do the maneuver at the same time and they come up and it's just very smooth, very calculated. There's no, um, no hesitation and there's no anxiety in their voices. And mm -hmm. it's uh, this, the power of visualization for execution is so incredible. Uh, I already mentioned Napoleon Hill and we we talk about, there's some others that are, are doing this more modern day stuff. Dr. Joe Dispenza talks about this where um, you get uh, vision boards. Uh, I'm sure everybody's heard of vision boards and stuff, but you, you have to connect your subconscious with your conscious mind. And that's what this whole 
rehearsal of concept thing is doing. So we go in depth into uh, all of that stuff with, with stealth-based leadership. And then team-based leadership is more, again, more of a broad audience. And we talk about uh, stealth bomber goal setting and execution. We talk about team building and delegation and all of this stuff to make your team function really well. And even at the airline, we do this really well because you have standard operating procedure, you have checklists and everybody. So you can pull somebody off the street that is qualified and put them in the seat and you know what they're going to do. And it's so critical that you have that in your business and you set up that avenue because um, in order to build highly functioning teams, you need to have some sort of standard that everybody is going for. And so we talk about setting that up and how to do that for your corporation or your business, your enterprise. Um, and so those are the three and we can intertwine based on your needs. And then I also do executive coaching to really get into, uh, helping because it's, it's lonely at the top, right? Be, you know, nobody is there to bounce things off of. And, and it's so critical that we are continually growing and, and divesting these ideas, these great ideas that we have bouncing them off somebody and saying, Hey, look, uh, how does this look? How do I grow? How do I become better? And giving you different techniques to do all that. So, so the feedback is a critical component. We're, we're doing a lot of work at the moment around communication. And I know you talk mm. about eliminating the stovepipe mentality within the team environment, uh, which which I believe is so important. Um, I'm not sure everyone will know that term. It's a little bit American, but maybe yeah, you can okay. explain. <laughs> so stovepiping, what does that mean for you? Yeah, so stovepipes are, are very toxic for your organization. It's people that that get a little bit of expertise and they hold on to that, right? And so they view themselves as a subject matter expert for, for that particular deal. And they're not willing to share it with anybody. They want people to come to them, right? You're always going to come to me. But the problem with that is that, uh, you know, if that person's gone, maybe they're sick or whatever, they're, they're out of touch. And you need that that expertise. And if they're not willing to share and teach that to those around, we should all be trying to, to make each other better. Right. Mm. And uh, so that was a big thing in the stealth bomber is you had these little, these little enclaves of knowledge and you had to get them all together and we would have different trainings and, and different things for that. And so we will talk about how to eliminate those stovepipes, but but just a stovepipe in general, if somebody's somebody's harnessing information that they should be getting out to everybody else, you need to take that person aside and say, hey, look, you know, we need to have a discussion because this is not working out too well. Right. You need to you need to be able to spread your knowledge and to help everybody grow. And that's how that's how you become better as well. So if people are fearful of their job, uh, fearful of their position, they they develop these stovepipes where they're like, I'm the, the sole nugget of information here. Everybody's got to come to me. So my job is protected. And yeah, we need to eliminate that. <laughs> yeah, very, very much. I only have a couple of questions remaining, so we'll wrap it up shortly. But um, I, I know you also talk about discipline. And I can imagine from a military perspective, the relevance and the importance of discipline. If we apply that to a leadership environment, um, the extent that discipline plays a role, what's your thoughts about that? Um, well, first we'll go with self-discipline, right? You need to, as the leader, you need to control yourself. You need to control uh, how you react to the the day and also how you're, uh, I think it was, who was it? Patton, General Patton came up with this. He's like, a leader is always on parade. And it's absolutely true. So uh, you may think that your, your activities outside of work are yours, uh, but that's not really the case. You're you're in a leadership position. Everyone is looking up to you. So you, what you tweet, what you put on Facebook, what you uh, do with your external activities. I mean, it's all being watched. And 
Um, so just remember that as the leader and have the discipline to and to harness the responsibility of that position. Um, I think that's probably the biggest thing with discipline. Now, as far as discipline for the team and in the organization, well, you can set up standard operating procedures. You can set up uh, standards. If you don't like standard operating procedure, just be like, hey, look, our bar is here. If you're not meeting it, then we need to raise your expectation uh, levels so that you can meet it. And I think we we need to do that within our organizations to to instill a baseline and then people can form their own discipline around that. And if they're not meeting it, then we have to have those discussions too. I think we're we're too afraid in in corporations to have that tough love kind of talk now. Mm. And a lot of it has come with there's there's some really great stuff with DEI, but yeah. there's some bad stuff too that has come. And everybody's kind of walking on eggshells, right? It's like, yeah. wow, can I say that? Can I do that? Can I do yes, you can't, you have to have that mentoring uh in order to grow. You know, if you I think I read recently that somebody at Facebook was making $190,000 a year for nothing. Like they literally did nothing. And now that position's eliminated because they're going through their year of efficiency or whatever. But it's like, come on now. Like <laughs> we can't have this. Sure, sure. Very good. So what are you working on at the moment, Joseph? Like what do you what's the next thing on the pipeline for you? So the next thing on the pipeline is uh, the next book in the in the series how to uh, how to elevate your life and leadership and this one's the art of elite execution and so I'm really distilling and these are like little pamphlet books really that you can go back and reference from time to time just hard hitting leadership knowledge that uh, that will help you and uh, so we're talking about contingency plans we're talking about rock drills. Uh, chair flying and how goes it meetings so important that you have checkup meetings a lot of times we get distilled into these meetings that don't lead anywhere right like oh i got a meeting at 9 a.m okay cool and then you know an hour later you guys didn't get anything accomplished what's going on so um so we talk about how to how to run your meetings more efficiently and with more purpose so start on time and uh, early if you can and give your folks back that most precious commodity of time uh so that's what i'm working on right now but uh in the broader sense i'm working on a lot of brain work like i i'm fascinated with the subconscious mind mm. so if you can get your subconscious on board with your conscious thinking you are going to explode and elevate uh hugely so i'm um, yeah. that's uh it's kind of a back burner project that'll be in probably the third or fourth book of this series so and i, I guess that's centered around habits and routines and all that yes absolutely and uh and then also vision what you visualize and um you know what you think you know what what you think is what you become and you're putting those thoughts out there in the universe and, and that's energy. And so you're going to reflect, you're going to get back what you put out. And I think that's, that's another reason why it is so important to be grateful for every day. Just, it just gets you in that great mindset of being, yeah. being nice. You know, we need to be, <laughs> we need to be nicer <laughs> to people. <laughs> You've mentioned chair flying several times, so I have I can't finish without finding out what that is. <laughs> so this is a concept that uh, it is it has to do with your your subconscious connecting to your conscious. It really does. And so um, when I was um, going through the B two initial program, you learn the T thirty eight Talon, which is a, a little mini fighter jet, and that's how we keep our hand skills and and our flying ability really fresh because you only fly the B two a couple times a month. So you start out flying this little fighter jet, and it scoots. I mean, it's uh it's fast. And I came from flying the the KC ten Extender tanker, and it was slow. So. Okay. Now I have to speed up my thinking and everything. And, and the program is not designed for me. It's designed for somebody that has flown the airplane previously and I had never flown it. And there's only 12 flights in the, in the entire syllabus to get done. And I started out and I was like, 
way what we call behind the jet and like just hanging on by the tail because everything was happening around me and I wasn't reacting to the, the environmental factors. I was just, I was passive and just letting things happen. I'm like, wow, no, I need to fly the airplane. And so uh, to get up to speed, I had to do this thing called chair flying. And what you do is um, you just visualize the whole flight. And it's kind of what goes back to uh, what the Blue Angels, what I mentioned earlier, but this is more in depth. This is all about you and what you're gonna do. So uh, so I would sit there in front of a, a, a cockpit um, photo and I would have all the switches and stuff. And so I'm like, okay, well now I'm gonna hit this switch and do this and this and this. And I've used this, whether it's learning a new airplane or learning marketing and sales, whatever it is, like, how do I become better? And you have to go through this kind of uh, chair flying experience where you're just visualizing, okay, so during the pre-flight, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna hit this switch, I'm gonna look for this and this and this. And then, you know, you're getting that subconscious program so that you're not having to think in the moment. You're your momentary your present thinking is all based on this experience that you've done in the background so if you want to learn concepts really really fast you need to chair fly and you need to practice these things uh whether it's yeah i mean just a sales call or um you know your new marketing ad how is this going to play out let's go through this and and let's chair fly it let's say hey uh, this is, what if this plays this way? What if this plays that way? Uh, how are we going to react to that? And now you already have that baseline knowledge. So when those situations come up, you can just react in the moment and it's no big deal. You can be like, okay, we're going to pivot this way. And that's how we do that. Yeah, I can, I can sleep easy tonight. Now I understand. So thank you for that. So the, the fantastic <laughs> thing about our brain is that our brain can't tell the difference, right, between simulation and reality. And that's Absolutely. What, what you're doing, what you're talking about, the chair flying, is really that simulation experience and the brain is seeing it as real. And when it comes to the reality, it's, it's, it's like it's already been doing it. Um, exactly. And you exponentially increase your ability to perform and execute, which is, I, I mean, that's that's where it's at, right? Execution's what we're graded on. Fantastic. Words of wisdom to leave the audience with, Joseph, as we finish up. Well, fantastic. This has been great. I, I'm just so excited to be here. Yeah. Um, Joseph, excellent con conversation. <laughs> I mean, we we could talk for hours. Literally, we could we could, we could just keep. Um, we we've only scratched the surface. So, I mean, I didn't even get to talk about Dave Ramsey and your uh, your work that you did with with Dave Ramsey. Many of the listeners, of course, will know of Dave Ramsey. So, uh, you do facilitation work. You do public speaking yeah. uh, as well as fly um, Top Gun type planes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I keep right. having this visual image of Maverick while you were talking, right? <laughs> Many visual images came of Maverick. Yeah, very good. But no, great, great catching up and connecting. And I, um, I'm sure the listeners will get a lot from our conversation. And uh, really appreciate you you finding the time. I know it's very early where you are over in uh, Las Vegas at the moment. So uh, appreciate that very much. Well, thank you for staying up late. And uh, yeah, no, this has been great. Um, you know, I would just leave the audience with one final thing, you know, get out there and volunteer for whatever your cause is. Uh, for me, I'm very passionate about uh, the homeless issue here in Vegas and in the mm -hmm. States in general, it's, it's a big problem. Uh, and it's, you know, you peel back the onion and there's so many layers and so many causes for this. And, uh, there's a great organization called shine a light here in Las Vegas. And I get out there and you go out and, and you talk to the homeless and you figure out where they're at and if they're ready to come off the streets and, and if they're, if they are, they can go and get a bed right now. And they start this recovery process of, and it's a six month uh, zero failure rate, by the way, of this, but, uh, but you have to be ready, you know, you have to be ready to come out. And a lot of people are ingrained into that. And uh, they just, 
we'll hand them water and socks and stuff and say, Hey, you know, if you're ever ready, let's go. But, uh, but find something that you're passionate about and help um, give of your unique talents and gifts because we all have stuff to give. And I'm, I'm very passionate about spreading that message because you have gifts that I don't have. Right. And, uh, and we need to spread those to the world to make everybody better. Final, final uh, question. Where can people find you if they want to connect with you and uh, have a conversation? Yeah, so, thanks. Uh, I'm all over social media. Uh, website is uh, stealthelevation.com. Uh, but you can find me either Joseph Van Dusen on LinkedIn, Stealth Elevation. Uh, I'm under both of those names. You'll I'll come right up, whether it's uh, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, whatever. I do all kinds of little videos and uh, just try to spread spread little nuggets of knowledge here and there. But uh, uh, you can find me um, in any of those spots, and then the contact information is there. Excellent. Well, Joseph, thanks so much for being on the ET Project. It's been fantastic, and I look forward to uh, staying in contact. Thank you. Oh, it's been great. Thanks, Wayne. Have a great day. And uh, yeah, everybody keep elevating. So what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button below and click on the bell icon so I can pop up in your feed occasionally with a great tip for your ultimate growth.